Welcome to Moss Marketing Monday, a.k.a. the M3 Podcast. Brought to you by Moss Marketing Group. Bringing you everything marketing every Monday. Stay tuned for marketing tips and tricks you can use today. The M3 Podcast. Marketing knowledge to help you succeed. Let's get started. Welcome back to the M3 Podcast. This week, we got Dalton Logan from the MMG Squad, and we have Chris Bell from the National Golf Course. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it, guys. Absolutely. You are the Director of Memberships, correct? Yes, that's right. So what does a job like that entail? Um, I say this in all the um, new hire orientations. I've got the hardest, most stressful job in the company, which is um, showing people around the club and winding them and dining <laughs> them and getting to take the checks from them to join the club. And um, the cool part about that is most people in this country want to uh, get to the country club lifestyle. And uh, I'm the person to show off the high-end private country club and make that happen. So, yeah. Uh, I think you have a dream job. And you get to golf all the time. Yeah, I mean, from where I'm from, it's a, like I say, I moved to this country to um, play golf in the sunshine and I get to do that every day and get paid for it. So, yeah, it's it's not terrible. It doesn't sound like it. So that's that's currently where we're at. So let's uh, let's start from the beginning. Where did you grow up? Because I think everyone that's probably listening hears that you have a little bit of an accent. He's got an accent, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm from a small town, dead central Scotland, basically right in between Glasgow and Edinburgh. Um, but what do you mean? Where are we start? Where are we starting from the start here? When did you start golfing? Um, so it's first picked up a golf club when I was 13 years old. Um, found a found a random golf. Well, first of all, I played soccer, and I was too lanky to be good at that. So, I can I can relate with that. So I mean, you guys could probably make across the field a lot faster than most people can. Yeah, I mean, you still got to get the ball across the field. <laughs> yeah. In Central Scotland, it's all about football. I'm not going to call it soccer because it's football, um, but it just kind of. When Wimbledon was on, we picked up a tennis racket. When the Open Championship was on, we picked up a golf club. And uh, my dad played. My dad was a butcher when I was growing up, and he um, he used to play one event um, every year for like an outing. So we had a couple of golf clubs in the shed, and found it one day and picked it up and started messing around with it and um, became pretty good at it and kind of started going into the golf clubs and then started playing county level, then played international level. And then how old were when you, how old were you when you were playing at a national level? So I, fra- I first picked up a club when I was 13 and then got to scratch golf for about three years. So I was 16 then. Um, and then, between 16 and 18, won a few Scottish events and then got asked to play for the um, top five in the country. So I was 17 and a half, 18. Did, what type of like training or coaching went into those three years to get you to scratch? And that's a, that's a, I think anyone who plays golf knows that that's a pretty difficult that task. <laughs> so the Logan's going to start taking notes. He's going to pull a notebook out of his I'm pocket. <laughs> the, the big part for me is um, whenever you're – getting to that level and getting to playing for international level um you normally pick up a club a lot younger than 13 years old so they they pick you up when you're normally 10 or 11 and kind of put you through coaching programs um but to be honest for me it was standing on a driving range beating golf balls for 10 18 hours a day and the hardest part about that was it was raining most of the time as well so um that's what i find crazy about my life now that is um i don't need to do that because it doesn't rain, so yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like that probably does help you though when it when it is rainy here and you're playing in an event. Yeah, I mean, it's when you're playing tournaments here and it gets windy. It's it's funny watching the way that a lot of American people here hit the golf ball because um, they try and hit it the same regular way that they would hit a shot um, when it's not windy. Um, but growing up playing in St Andrews and playing these kind of links golf courses, you need to learn to hit it the height of this room. So. Um, it helps a lot whenever you're playing in the um, in the wind. But then on top of that, I became a master when I was young at using an umbrella. So um, that helped <laughs> a lot. Too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you play in high school. And when you said county, because you guys don't have like states in Scotland, do you? No. 
So it's like is like a county. Yeah. So he's basically you're you're playing at county level. So each county will have a like a a team of ten. So your golf club would have a team, and then you would move on to a county level, and then you would move on to the international level. So gotcha. So then you work through county level, you get to national level. What does it look like playing nationally for Scotland? Um. So I played three events. Um, and whenever you're playing in the basically the qualifiers for to get to the national level, it's kind of like a point system. Um, but I went in there. Most of the guys that are playing on that are the kids who got the coaching since they were 10, 11 years old. Yeah. Um, I just kind of stepped in there and showed up one tournament and won the tournament. And they're like, who's this guy? So what's up? They're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah, I didn't get any coaching. I just stood in the driving range for 18 hours a day for the past three years. So, um, yeah, but that's they picked the top five in the country. Um, so we they flew us to uh, Lake Como in Italy to play the first one. Um, so we played against Shane Lowry over there. So you probably know who that is. Uh, Danny Willett, Tommy Fleetwood, yeah. all those guys were on those teams. Um, and then, I mean, we played that one. We played the Home Internationals twice. And there was another one we played in Royal Liverpool. Uh, but I mean, it's basically the top five people in your country um, that play against each other. Um, and then you decide from that point whether you want to um, turn professional or not. Um, but I didn't have the option of having family money backing, so it was um, get to work basically. So started working in call centers. Um, so that's where my sales career started. Um, then sitting on a dialer for nine hours a day doing 250, 300 phone calls. Done that and then kind of moved up a little bit, started working for Xerox making appointments for the sales guys. And then from there, I moved into an outside sales role. I've done that and that's where the sales career started. I think, well, what did your golf career look like or while you were? So at that point I was playing some amateur events, Scottish amateur, British amateur, that type of stuff. And it was kind of like trying to save up the money through my job um, to kind of further the professional golf career. So most of the kids that come over to the US to um, do golf scholarships, they, um, they go when they're 18, 19, um, oh. but I had to have a few years of kind of working behind me to save up a little bit. And um, I was 20, right before I turned 23, um, kind of decided, which is basically the way that it works as a recruitment agency. So you, they go online, they take a couple of videos of your golf swing and your golf resume and stuff. And when you've been playing top five in your country, then a lot of the coaches over here are like, hey, um, we want this guy. So I um, had a couple of offers, uh, a couple in Florida, two in California and two in Texas. And then I uh, got a random call from a uh, um, guy from West Texas, which I'd never heard the accent before, which was really weird. <laughs> <getting that one. laughs> it was really weird getting that phone call. I'm like, Who's that this phone guy? call probably should have been recorded. That'd yeah. Been a good phone call. I remember I was, I was laying on the sofa with a couple of my buddies like that right here. <laughs> and I, I'm like, who's just called me? So he, um, he called me and he's like, hey, we're going to pay for your room, your school, your books, your flights, the whole lot. It won't cost you a single dime for two years of college. And I'm like, how quickly can I get a visa? So um, that I got that phone call in November 2010. Um, and then I was on an airplane in January 15th, 2011. So, oh, wow. And up to this point, did you ever have a formal coach? Uh, no. 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 Just no. all self It was all self-taught. It was all... That's admirable. I, I, that's crazy. Yeah, it was. It was a lot of um, a lot of watching videos, uh -huh. especially Ernie Els, Freddie Couples, and then obviously Tiger Woods, and they were the big ones. But the, the big part for me on the golf game was, um, yes, everyone swings it different, but there's a few certain things in the golf swing that's that's the same on all of them. When it's grip, alignment, and not moving your head, yeah. and when I kind of figured that out, um, it was just practice, practice, practice. So yeah. Yeah, I haven't figured that's those things out. I know what I'm supposed to do. I just well, can't. Well, uh, he was saying that, you know, he's playing uh, whatever nationally or county in three years. And I'm like, well, I've been playing like three or four years and I still suck. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you said you were 23 when you came over, right? Uh, yeah, right around 20, right just before I turned 23. So you're 22 years old and mm -hmm. it's off yeah. to the state you go. Yep. And you're going to show up in West Texas. Yeah, it was another part of that too, is I had my life set there. I had a company car. I had a car in finance. I had uh, my own place. I had the whole thing. And it was basically, can I get rid of all that, quit the job, and went from all that to a set of golf clubs in a suitcase. And then 
went from Glasgow to London, London to New York, New York to Dallas. And then the crazy part about this is we're getting on that um, kind of shaky plane that goes from Dallas to Midland, the small one. <laughs> that, that I can't stand in because I'm too tall for it. And again, I'm freaking out because my life's just about to change and I didn't know what was going to be on the other end. And then um, sitting in that aeroplane and kind of, it was, plane was coming down, it was turning left and I'm looking at the window and I'm seeing all those pump jacks and all field stuff, equipment, and I'm like, to the guy next to me, I'm like, we must be crashing here. <laughs> He's, like, He's like, nope, this is West Texas. So, um, Landed there, and a couple of days after that, I figured out that I wasn't want to go back. So, yeah. So and here we are, twelve, nearly twelve and a half years later. So, yeah. So you was, ended up in West Texas. What did the story start like there? How how did the the progression of golf? <laughs> so the funny part about that was um, with the the golf resume that I had. Um, yeah, you've got a reputation as a good golfer in Scotland, but I mean, opposite end of the planet here, nobody who knows who you are. And, They've only seen a couple of swing videos and that's fine. And so I get to the airport and there was a press conference waiting at the airport, I mean, newspapers and, I, and I'm like, I, mean, I just played for my country and I was never in the newspaper, like what's happening here? <laughs> so done that and then they put you on the front of the newspaper and it was like, hey, this guy's gonna come over from Scotland and help us win the national championship. And um, got to realize that I didn't know how to play golf in this country because the, it's 50 degrees warmer, the, the ground's hard, it's kind of completely different. So um, first ever qualifying round that I scored was 94. Um, handing that scorecard to my coach was very difficult. So, um, but again, it was like, I don't know how to do this, but I figured it out before and I'll do it again. So it was back to the same, back to square one and standing in the driving range and beating golf balls. And that was pretty much what it was. I feel like that's a mindset that not all people have. Where did that come from for you? Was that something that you were taught like before um, golf as a young kid? I think a lot of it was um, we used to get kind of a lot of kids talking smack to me because I was the only one that kind of left football and played golf. And um, But the big one for me was um, I went to beat the golf course. Like I'm not interested in beating – my opponent, if I beat the golf course, then that person's going to be getting beat anyway. Um, but the big thing growing up at the, in the club that we were in, it was um, it was you wanted your name on the um, the club championship board. Yeah. Um, and when I finally done that, when I was 16, uh, the guy that I'd beat um, in the championship final, um, he had been the champion for I think like five or six years in a row. Um, so that was a major driver for me. Like. Everybody wants to be that kid. And then I was like, I want to be that kid. Um, finally beat him. Um, and then it was kind of, I even today, when I played golf today, it was like I'm beating the golf course. Like I'm not worried about the two guys I'm playing yeah. with. Like I'm playing against the golf course. And the fact that I was under par today, um, I beat the golf course. So, yeah. Would you say like overall people's, people's mindset or, you know, just how they play the game is different in Scotland? I mean, because I know there's a lot of history with golf in Scotland and yeah. in the U.S. Like, is there is there a difference there? I, no, I don't think. I think there's a lot more people, um, more positive and more dedicated over here. Um, but also, you've got the sunshine. Not a lot of people want to go stand yeah. in the piss and rain for um, hours on end like what I did. Um, but for me, it was just again the, the I want to beat the golf course and I want to be uh, want to be the best at the game. Um, but the the financial side kind of held me back a little bit. Um, but then when I done when you're standing in 110 degree heat in the sunshine, going this is awesome because I've spent so many hours practicing in the rain. It was a uh, it felt pretty good, and then I wanted to kind of progress it from there after that too. So, so I think that's a pretty unique mindset that you have when you golf of actually just playing the course and not playing the people that you're around because I will say that dictates when I go out and golf and I go play with I go down to Florida only for a week or two mm -hmm. in January February and I golf with my fiance's dad every single morning we play 18 holes first tee time every single morning the whole time we're there I played the best golf of my life but I'm playing with a bunch of guys that are over 65 no one's hitting yep. super far and I'm like, I'm not trying to kill the ball. It's actually <laughs> yeah. it, pretty enjoyable, and I play good golf. And then I come back here, and I play with a bunch of college buddies. It's like a long drive competition. And, and you're trying too hard. And we're all yeah. playing in the woods. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it just turns into like a completely different game. The big thing for me, though, is uh, like golf's the hardest sport ever created, 100%. Oh, like when yeah. you've got 
the bunker. hole should when, definitely be bigger. <laughs> that, that, I, I agree with that one. Yeah. I agree with that one. But it's like you've got so many factors that are involved with it. Um, but the the big thing for me is a lot of people watch me play golf now and they're like, oh, you make it look easy. But they didn't see me hitting 18 hours a day in the rain to figure it out. Everybody wants to come out and especially when you get to that level of business that you, allows you to go play golf. Um, you think by playing once every two weeks, you're going to be good at it. And it's just yeah. not going to happen yeah. at all. I think yeah. that goes to the the statement that I believe champions are born when people aren't watching. Oh, 100%. Everyone loves to see what a champion does when they're out actually performing or doing whatever in front of yep. people. Same thing in business and whatever you're doing in life. What matters is what you do when people aren't watching. So putting in those hours at the driving range. I remember the first year Dalton started playing golf, he probably played better than he does now. But he was at the driving range like three, four times every single week. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And it was – I've been once this this summer. Yeah. It shows. So it's like – Definitely it, shows. It makes a huge difference. When you're swinging a golf club every day, I mean, tempo go, tempo's right. All those things get correct. and It's amazing. The couple of times I've played like rounds on a trip or something, three days in a row, by the third day, how much more comfortable I feel, how yeah. much can, more consistent my ball striking Building is. Building confidence, yeah. Yeah. The other part of that too is it's like I see so many people spending hours and hours and hours of practicing, but they're practicing the wrong thing, so they're wasting their time. Yeah, It's getting the fundamentals correct, the grip, alignment, keeping your eye on the golf ball, and just keep doing it. Because a lot of people say, oh, what do, you, what do you work on? I'm like, I'm looking at my – golf's about hand and eye coordination. I'm working on looking at the golf ball as long as I possibly can. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And so, alignment's, alignment's the biggest one too. A lot of people – I'll go to a driving range anywhere that I've played golf all over the world, like, and you're standing and you watch a guy in the driving range and he hits a shot and he's like, damn it, he hit a bad shot. But I was standing watching the way he was aligned. He was aligned 20 yards right and he hit it 20 yards right. So he's hit a perfect shot, but he's expecting it to go over here, but he doesn't know. He doesn't, mm -hmm. he's not practiced it, he's not learned it, he's not being coached. So. so when you got to West Texas, did you have a coach there? A uh, golf coach, yes. So did that make a big difference in? I mean, coach gave us a kind of little bit of pointers here and there. He was a baseball player that kind of turned into a golfer. Um, it wasn't full on um, golf coach, um, but he did give you a little bit of pointers, especially when it was me trying to learn how to hit it off basically that, which mm -hmm. is the fairways over in West Texas. There's not much grass <laughs> over there. Um, but I wouldn't say it was full on um, golf coach, and it was kind of small pointers to uh, teach you how to play golf in West Texas. So how long were you in West Texas? Uh, well, so I was, I was there for a year and a half in junior college. Um, then I turned professional after I finished that and I went to San Angelo, which is two hours west. I hope I got that right. East, probably. Midland, like northeast. I need to pull up a map. Anyway, it's one of the directions. <laughs> but it's two hours from there, and I've kind of done the assistant golf professional thing there, um, straight out of college. Um, and then done that for a year and a half. Um, but when you're an assistant golf professional at a golf course, um, you're basically a golf club salesman. You're not a golf professional. You're standing in the golf shop for eight hours a day, and you can't play golf. The only person that's called the golf professional is the only one that can't play golf. So um, decided that that wasn't for me and went back into the sales world again. Um, and then I went back to West Texas and done some all field jobs kind of back and forth and um, got into the staffing industry um, 2014 um, and then opened up an office there doing the temporary staffing, then moved to Seattle, done it there. I've done all the work for the Seahawks and the, the Mariners up in Seattle. So we're putting um, 250 to 500 employees in there to clean the stadium every weekend, mm. which mm. is not an easy job. So how do, how did you get into that, into staffing? So that was a, it was basically a sales job, like kind of as a general manager type job running an office. Um, they only had a couple of customers that was brand new. Um, so my job was to kind of go out and get contracts, mainly for um, construction, uh, hotel cleaners, that type of stuff, especially in West Texas, and a lot of it was all field hands and stuff. Um, grew that office to a certain number, and then they offered me the job in Seattle. Um, so done the same thing in Seattle, kind of selling contracts, and the biggest one we got was the, the Seahawks. Um, but the mistake I made at the Seahawks stadium was I went into um, the, the guy who was running the Airmark contract within there, 
Um, and he was like, well, we're only getting 60 people a weekend from you guys. And I was like, well, how can I up that? And he's like, well, I need like 400. And I was like, well, I'll do it by next week. Big mistake. Yeah, so we had to go out and find um, 450 people that were willing to work minimum wage, cleaning up, picking up trash in the, uh, the Seahawks stadium. So, so how did you find those people? Um, that was flyers, phone calls, knocking on doors, just a bunch of different stuff. Mo most of the stuff then was kind of uh, Facebook, so we kind of found a lot of them through that. But we ended up doing it, and that ended up being one of the biggest contracts that they had. So um, it was pretty successful. The the stress po stressful part of that was dealing with those type of people. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of bad backgrounds mm -hmm. and alcohol problems and that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, but if they showed up to work, a lot of them done it correctly. So yeah, um, done that for a year and then moved to Houston. Uh, done it the same thing in Houston for NRG Stadium for the Texans. Um, but again, this is kind of bouncing around and you're like. I still want to play golf, still want to play golf. So I um, ended up moving back to West Texas, um, back to do some oil field stuff and some drill pipe inspection. Um, and then more recently I was doing, um, I was selling first aid kits and um, PPE equipment in the oil field. And but built a house, kind of living the West Texas life, kind of doing pretty good. <laughs> like I thought it was good. Like, I mean, I had two cars, motorcycle, um, House is going well, and it just finally got to a point where it clicked. I'm like, I'm done with this. Like, I can't do it any longer. Um, kind of asked a few questions around, and I uh, found Michael Walker, who's the general manager at the National. Um, jumped on a phone call with him, and he's like, uh, how quickly can you be here? I was like, I'm packing my stuff right now. <laughs> <laughs> so within, I think, a week and a half, I was here in Kansas City. So, Which, what I find is crazy is, like, when you meet people from the United States, and I feel like it's pretty common, and – with the way that they like operate their lives. And I, I have some friends that are from South Africa and I have some people f that I know that come from foreign countries here that how quickly they'll just like, yep. moving 10 hours away here isn't like that big a deal to them. Yep. And where we're like, if I move 30 minutes one direction, I'm like, I don't know, that might be a little too far. So <laughs> the first time, especially the first time being as large as it was, like moving to the other end of the planet like that, I mean, I had no earthly idea what was on the other end of that. And for it to be Odessa, Texas on the other end and still <laughs> stay over here, um, it, was, um, it was tough to do that. But like you said now, like it's, I could pack my stuff tomorrow and go. Yeah, and that's... It gets a lot easier the more you do it. <laughs> yeah, same as golf. So the other thing too, though, that I think that what we see from people that never struggle with employment, never struggle with... I don't know, finding those like higher level jobs is having a sales background. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And I think, I mean, I come out of the automotive space. I sold cars for a long time. I became, I was very successful at that. Mm -hmm. And I think when people have that, they just learn a different level of people skills. The big one for me was um, starting call centers. Like call centers taught me so much. Like I was, I was calling people when house phones were still a thing like getting people's credit card information on the first phone call. Like I was doing that three and four and five times a night, like on sitting on a dialer. And as soon as that, as soon as somebody went F you and hung up on you, then the next call would go through. And you learned that thick skin deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think that helped a lot, especially when you move from that into um, outside sales. Um, and then whenever you're in Scotland doing that stuff, you're just another salesperson. But over in this country, your accent helps a lot whenever you're doing that too. So that's a huge part of how um, success is a little bit easier for me than a lot of people. But with having the um, the telesales background, nobody wants to pick up a phone these days. Oh no, that's mm -hmm. I'm on the phone all day, every day. Me and, too. <laughs> yeah. And people think it's just like crazy. Like businesses we work with, they're like, I just call you. Like when we get on a phone call. I'm like. I'd rather just have a five, 10 minute phone call and get handled instead of texting you all goddamn day long. Yep. Even, even in, even in this business that we're in here, like everybody wants to do emails and write these long structured emails and our general manager will tell you the same thing. He's like, I, like just pick up the phone and call the guy. Yeah. The problem will be over or the, the issue will be fixed in two minutes flat. And let me send an email because they're afraid of that rejection mm -hmm. from whatever it is, but. I don't have that. And the other thing too is like when you're sending emails, you're sending text messages, there's not a tone. And a lot of times that yep. tone can be, yeah. you may word it a little bit. You could word it one way and you can have three different people read the same email 
and I'll read it three completely different yeah. ways. Yeah. And you get on the phone and you're laughing with someone, you're talking with them. You can make a problem, not a problem really quick. Yep. Yeah. And you can have that email that is, does not go well. And that's where I think in automotive sales, I was 18 years old when I first started. And my dad's like, you don't get to talk to people that drive onto the lot. He goes, you don't get to do anything. You don't get fresh leads. He goes, you're going to go through all the old leads yeah. and call people that aren't even in market. Yeah. So I'm calling people that already have cars. They bought them somewhere else. And it's like trying to talk and see if they like their car. Done like, a lot more that way too. Yeah. But it was like yeah. a whole different kind of sales. And then when I got to where I actually had like new fresh leads, I'm like, these people are easy. I'm like, they actually want to buy a car. <laughs> <laughs> but I think having that rejection side on the – and I mean, I was making probably like 50 to 100 calls a day. I mean, 250, 300 calls a day. That's a shit ton of calls. Yeah. Yeah, but you're, just, you're not manually dying. That. That's all a computer that's doing it for you. Yeah. Which also, that was like a just a pen of like you, your 15 minutes breaks here, and then you better be straight back because that phone call starting again. Yeah. <laughs> that was back in the day, though. That's not how it is today. But, um, and like, like you said, from my experience, there's no time to breathe in between them. So you, oh, no. you could get off a 45 minute call and you immediately hang up and it's doing the next. But person. the crazy thing about that particular job, too, again, that like that taught me a lot about having the thick skin when it comes to sales. But see the amount of people that I've seen on a weekly basis because they were turning over people like crazy yeah. in that company. And like, like most of these kind of younger girls are going in there at 18. Oh, yeah, it's a sales job. Your salary's X, but and then they go in and somebody starts mouthing off to them whenever they're calling them at eight o'clock at night. Like they're in tears crying and running <laughs> it, quitting the jobs. And I'm like, just on to the next call. Yeah. yeah. And that's also, you have to start understanding the the numbers in sales. You have to start understanding like, yeah. that's numbers, how yeah. I started justifying it to myself at 18 years old. It's a numbers game, yeah. I was like, if nine people tell me to fuck off and one person tells me yes, yep. I was like, then they all paid me. Like yep. if I made a thousand dollars on that deal, then I made a hundred dollars per call I made. So it's like I just had to justify it some way in my head that I like got off. That's quite it. funny that you actually think the same way as I did back then. Yeah, I would like tally them up, and I was like, some people were like, "You just need to increase increase your closing ratio." I'm like, "No, like I didn't get word out, and they were telling me to fuck off." I'm like, yeah. or sometimes you just can't get past it. So I'm like, I would just tally them, and then I'd like get one. I'm like, okay, now all these people that told me to fuck off, I got paid. <laughs> and it's crazy how simple doing those little things like the tallies can help you. Like uh, the book that we're reading right now is Atomic Habits. And they talk about just having like the guy would have a just a jar of paper clips, with, like 200 paper clips in it. And every time he made a call, he would just move one over to the next yep. cup or jar. And he knew he'd made 200 calls when it was full. And then he just repeated the <laughs> next day. It was like yeah. just a visual comforting thing. And I think doing things like that, I think a lot of people have never went through that and they've mm -hmm. never experienced rejection. I think a lot of people are terrified of That's it. That's why a lot of people fail, uh, fail people sell, sales people fail. It is. And they, they think that every single person they, is going to say yes to you. They think that everyone's going to come to them. And it's just not the way it works. And in any position too, like even I was pretty successful at the last job I was in and I'm selling first aid kits. So I'm going to every business on a street. And when's the last time you thought about your first aid kit in your office? Unless somebody cut their finger last week. Uh, I, I've i never thought about it. Exactly. I would tell yeah. Dalton to hit CVS if someone got hurt. <laughs> yeah. So with this, when it comes to like OSHA compliance and that type of stuff, I'm going in there and I mean, if I walk into your office tomorrow and you're super busy, you're going, I don't care about the first aid kit. Yeah. Until somebody chops their finger off and then you do. So that was going in there and trying to get that person's attention. And a lot of that kind of, came to a head and I'm like, I want to go back into the golf business because it sucks. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk to you. You know what I mean? Whereas in yeah. this position, everybody wants to talk to you. Yeah. And you're dealing with a, a very high level clientele now, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. But they all also need first aid kits. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Everyone has got an office, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And I, I think when the people you have now, and I'm assuming when you were doing the first aid kits, you had gatekeepers to try to get. Oh, yeah. Know, most of it was. Yeah. To get to the right person. Now you have the person's coming to you probably Who's the, 10 out of 10 times is the, the decision maker yeah. yep. that's looking to have a membership, something like that. Yep. And you also have a product that is pretty impressive. Yeah. That I feel is almost unmatched kind of yeah. in the area. Yeah. I, mean, I said that to you guys earlier too. Like, and I say it a lot. And again, the GM, he kind of, kind of talks it up because I never be quiet about it, but I've played golf in a lot of countries in the world and there's not a better one than that. There's just not. 
And if anybody tries to tell me otherwise, they're just straight up lying. Like it's just like it's that impressive. It's one of those places where, like, apart from St Andrews, it's one of those places you kind of go out there and you play golf on it, and you're just happy all the time. Yeah, you know I mean, and you can't look around and go oh, that, that fairway over there is terrible, or that green's got this footprint. It just it doesn't happen. So, I will say that one of the best golf courses I've ever, I've ever played was in Cabo, and I don't tip my time. I'd be lying if I told you what the name of it was, <laughs> but it was the hottest golf I've ever played, which it's on the ocean. It's super cool. It, it looks great. They have Mexico. They do these like little stations every yep. like three holes. They have like quesadillas and margaritas and drinks and everything. Mexico, I was like, yeah. I was like, Hey, it's pretty good, pretty good time. And, but it, the heat is just destroys you. And Don't that's like golf in Odessa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to check that one off my list and just, or yeah. just take it off of the list yeah. altogether. Probably not want to go there. Yeah. yeah. But I think Missouri has a great, like, I'll go out a lot of times with my fiance on Sunday evenings. It's just like a, we have a different type of weather that you can go out and play at 60, 70 degrees and not roast. The one what? thing that got me too is I, which again was strange. Like, I didn't know nothing about Missouri. I didn't know nothing about Kansas City. I, like, I knew nothing. And then um, when I got up here, um, February last year, I pull into the parking lot of the National and it's all yellow grass. And I'm like, oh, God, this again. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've just dealt with that for the past 12 years, right? And then um, just the strangest thing I've ever seen, because like in Scotland, it's always green, like all the time. It's never dormant. And then I go to West Texas, it's always dead. And then I come up here and they're like, no, no, just wait a couple of weeks and it'll change. So then... I could literally watch the tree grow outside my office window. Like it would it changed that quick. And then within two weeks, the whole golf course is green. And that like I'm um, depressed back at a yellow golf course again, completely changed. And mm-hmm. and then if you go out there now, you guys have seen the pictures I've posted the past couple of days. Like it literally is like flush carpet out there. It's, uh, yeah. So you what, you got here in February this year? Last year. Last year. Mm-hmm. What was your opinion of the winner here? I'm interested to hear. The only thing that I didn't really like about it um was that i couldn't go out and i could go out and play golf but it's whenever it got to the the icy stuff like i mean I've, yeah. I've dealt with that in scotland for a long time um but luckily enough one of my buddies opened an indoor golf facility in parkville as well so we've done a lot of indoor golfing um through the winter time and then because of that we've kind of we're looking at putting golf simulators in the golf club as well because a lot of people ask me about that they'll go hey can I switch off my membership at a certain date because I can't play golf? And I'm like, well, no, you can't. It's kind of month to month. Um, but we also own a um, golf simulator company as well. So that's the next part of our phase of kind of renovating the club too, is putting the simulators in there, which will, again, attract more members because they can play all year yeah. round. So. I, I was curious if you guys had them. We were yeah, talking we, about we were it talking earlier about today. Yeah, yeah, Lionsgate just put them in there. They were basically kind of testing on it. Um, but we just done, again, that $2.5 million <laughs> restaurant. So... Um, most of the bigger financial stuff's going to hold for a little bit, but um, it will happen at some point. Yeah. But as for the winters, I mean, it didn't bother me too much because first 23 years of my life was rain and snow and sleet. Yeah. And, yeah. But um, with indoor golf, then we're good, basically. That's good. So we kind of skipped over something I want to go back to. Like you said whenever you got uh, to West Texas, there was a newspaper reporter. They said that this guy's here to win us a national championship. Let's talk a little bit more about your college career. Did that happen, or how did your college playing career kind of unfold? Uh, well, I mean, the first couple of times we played golf, I didn't know how to do it. So it took probably a couple of months to figure that out. Um, ended up winning, I think, four tournaments when I was there for a year and a half. Um, college career for me wasn't used, and it's probably disrespectful to America, but anyway, here we are. Like, I didn't use it for the education part. I used it to come here and play golf in the sunshine. Oh, completely. It's a, a stepping yeah. stone to turning professional and kind of... I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. I think our education no. system is flawed here anyway. Yeah. So. We'll just, none of us yeah. are really using our degree now. Yeah. Perfect. There in we our, go there. In our yeah. Career, so. yeah. The only reason mine <laughs> hangs in my office is because I still pay 141 a month for it. <laughs> <laughs> Once that yeah. last payment goes down, it comes it's down. It's coming down. <laughs> Another cheese poster going up. <laughs> <Yeah. again. laughs> Something else that's a lot cooler than that degree will go up yeah. instead. Uh, but I mean, I, I kind of basically done all of the basic classes to kind of pass my classes. But um, we finished, I think, fourth in the national championship, um, fourth the first time and then fifth the second time or something. But we did get our team at that time 
um, to number one in the nation for junior college. So we had a pretty successful golf team. Um, but they'd asked me to move to Texas Tech after I finished college. But at this point, I'm 25. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing college anymore. I'm going making money. So, yeah. 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 I don't think I could keep rocking out college at 25. Yeah, no. Yeah, I was especially doing basic math. <laughs> <laughs> so the math that I done in college, I'd actually done it when I was like 14 in high school in the UK. So that's saying something. So is I don't know how the school system is over at overseas. Is it morally? I, I don't. Know. It's not as forced upon you. Um, it, you don't graduate high school. Where I'm from, you don't get congratulated for like learning the alphabet and stuff, which they do. Yeah, uh, which is crazy. To I, me. I do think it's kind of weird. Like I've, I always kind of had that deal. Like I don't know why people uh, throw like big celebrations for graduating high school. Like I didn't want it. Yeah, and I, I think that's just kind of like a requirement. Like you should do that. Yeah, I mean, it, a lot of the people, unless you want to be a, like I'm just thinking about the people that I went to school with. I mean, unless you're like a a school teacher or a doctor or that type of stuff like you don't really want any other higher education it's kind of you get to 16 and go do you know what this sucks i'm going to be a plumber so or, or a carpenter or whatever it is you kind of go into a field um whereas it's either going into that type of field or doing what i've done which is basically like banks and large companies that have got call centers and that's how you start a sales career um mm -hmm. and how that just even to think about the fact that that's all ended up me sitting here doing this is nuts so yeah, but yeah. it worked i guess so yeah yeah, uh, the world happens in a magical way that puts you exactly where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. Yeah, if you'd asked me that a year and a half ago, I would have told you no, though. I was ready to go home last year. Yeah. Do you back still? To, oh, yeah. Back overseas? Yeah. Do you still have family over there? Oh, whole yeah. family still yeah. over there, yeah. So are you a citizen here or? Uh, green card. Green card? Yeah. So I've got that. And I've got the option to do um, the test to your, for your citizenship. But I mean, the only difference between me and you in that situation is voting and I'm not interested in voting in any country I live in. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just accept the fact that you get screwed on taxes and then is, move on. Are you guys, as, is your taxes over there as bad as it is here? I, I mean, I don't know what your guys' government looks like. I mean, I don't know exactly how it's working now, but the, the big thing that I've noticed that like the difference between over there and over here is, um, you don't make as much money over there. Um, so even like one of the sales jobs that I had over there, um, compare it to the same over here, your salary is probably $50,000 more a year to do it here than it is to do it over there. And then the government takes that extra 50. It's exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 They said, oh, gotcha, yeah. that's ours. So what would you say the biggest differences from Scotland and the United States are? Sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, 23 years in the rain. But I mean, I think the, the the outlook that people have over here is a lot better. Like you're telling the story about kind of starting your business and nobody's done it before. And if you were doing that where I'm from, you would get shot down in flames and they would kind of be so negative about it. Not everybody, but I'm just kind of going by my experience. Even the stuff that I've done too, like you get so much backlash for it and you're like, I'm happy. Like, why are you worried about what I'm doing? You know what I mean? Yeah. I will say there's way too many people that care what others do. Oh, yeah, 100%. Like, I'm somebody that, not saying this in a bad way, but I really don't give a shit what other people are doing. Like, it's it, not a bad way. It's, it, not, yeah. not, not like I don't give a shit, but it's just like you run and operate your life the way you want to do it. That's mm -hmm. not my job to say that's the right way, the, the wrong way, whatever. Yeah. So it's... When I do things like there's still a lot of negative backlash here. And I've yeah. talked about it on some other podcasts where I very much ignore the negative stuff that comes our way. That I get so many negative comments I get, on I the get it all the time. Yeah, all the time. I, I get negative stuff all the time on YouTube about the podcast, this and that, blah blah. If you don't blah. like it, don't watch it. Like, why yeah. are you watching it? I, I normally tell people, I'm like, <laughs> hey, I really enjoy your fucking podcast. <laughs> oh yeah, you don't fucking have one. Where, where is it at? So, oh, yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> so it's like. Everyone's really good about preaching from the bleachers when they're not doing something. Mm -hmm. And then the people that are out there doing it. And I mean, the more successful you get, the longer the the line of haters yeah. becomes. And it's funny since we've started, most of the people that really have a problem with what I'm doing, most of the people have been vocal about it. Not one of which has ever even had a job. They've all been people that are unemployed yeah. at some point. 
And you look at someone from Scotland that you may have been friends with or somebody that knows you, and they're like, this guy's now living in America getting to golf every day as a job. It's crazy, right? <laughs> it, it is. And you look at it, it's like yeah. that. Yep. And when that's what I hate a lot about how many people – diss on america and things like that about the american dream that you can do what you want here and then that's the thing like so i went back to scotland in november there um and all i heard was negativity all the time this sucks taxes suck inflation this and this and that and that, that. and i'm going like what are you doing about it move to america oh no i can't i've, I've got a dog what, <laughs> <laughs> what? Right, but like you, you hear these excuses all the time and they're like, oh, you're so lucky. How am I so lucky? I'd done it myself. Like, yeah. It was all on yeah. me. You took the risk. Yeah. And then it was, it's been, it's been ups, it's been downs, it's been good, it's been bad, it's been shitty. And now it's not. Yeah. And who done that? Me. Yeah. But no one, everyone looks at every single time that you do something, that there was some, same thing we're talking about that Atomic Habits book. In, in our company, we, we've made it a point that everyone in the company has to read a book every month. We read it as a group. I'm glad they don't do that at the golf club. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something that it's like, I want everyone. Can't even to, read an email. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, I want everyone to progress forward. And it's, they, they talk about all these little habits add up to something a lot larger. And everyone sees, once again, goes back to the, the champions. People see them at the top. They don't see all the work that goes in to get them mm -hmm. there. Yeah. They don't see all those habits of when they wake up every morning, they don't see yeah. the habits of what they're eating correctly. They don't, they don't see all these habits that add up to that. And now they see you where you're at now. And it's that road that everyone thinks that that's a really, really nice paved, smooth ass road to get there. I'm telling you, well, it's the roughest road you're ever going to fucking take. But when you get there, it's it, nice. It's just like talking about the, the girls or the salespeople who, you know, have one person tell them to, you know, F off and they're, crying in tears yep. or whatever about it the one of the things that stuck with me from that book too was like the difference between professionals and amateurs and people who are super successful and aren't is that like one setback or one bad day or one bad month doesn't define them they don't they just make sure that they don't have another one mm -hmm. they just get it going back in the right direction and not let it compound and that's negative things are going to happen and people are going to that's why you can't let people get to you. You can't let any of that, that stuff get to you. It's you're on your own path of where you're going. You just have to keep yeah. that ball moving. Work in a telesales environment and that goes away pretty quick. Work in what? Telesales, as in selling over the phone. Oh, yeah. Oh, the yeah. amount of people that talk so much nasty stuff and F off, and this, especially when you're a 17, 18 year old kid and you've never heard people talk. Like so, what were you before. selling when you were doing that? So, I started off doing, um, what was it? It was a, started on TV packages. And then I was doing. Um, it's like when you're selling TV packages, what like what? Basically selling Dish Network over the phone. Gotcha. Yeah, so you were just calling somebody up and saying, "Hey, what TV package do you have?" Or then the other one, we were selling international phone packages to that you had attached. That sound old. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so you were basically selling discounted calls to India or wherever the family members lived at. Um, and then from there, I moved into the Xerox world. So I started doing. Um, appointment making so you're calling calling businesses setting appointments for um you to upgrade your copy machine in your office um, and then from there kind of moved into the um outside sales so someone was making an appointment for me so do you think so you started off b2c and then you move into b2b business mm -hmm. b2b sales which one did you think was harder um I mean, the appointment making was easy, but the hardest thing was to try and get somebody's credit card information mm. over the phone. Um, on your first 15 minutes on a phone call, you've never even talked to this person. You know, yeah. Probably annoyed them when they're watching late night TV or whatever it was. We're calling them 8, 9, 10 at night too. Um, but yes, the outside sales was hard. But again, that getting the hard skin from the, um, the tele sales made it a little bit easier. And then again, Whenever you come over here and you're doing uh, business to business sales here, it's a whole lot easier when you talk like me. Mm -hmm. When you're walking in the gatekeepers, that's not a gatekeeper at that point when you've got an accent. <laughs> like, hey, I kind of want to talk to this guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> His office is right back there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's also, I think a, I think after people get into B two B biz, like B two B sales, I think B two C actually becomes easier. 
Yep. I think when you're when you start off B two C, you don't really understand the talent of navigating a conversation all the way through. Yep. You're not as disciplined with your words. You're not setting yourself up for a future conversation. You're much more like in your head trying to like, I got to sell this right now. I got, sell, I got, I got 15 yeah, minutes. Question, I, yeah. And then it's like, when you get into B2B sales, you're like, this has to be a lot more, like you have to have a lot more finesse to do it because you're dealing with a higher level mm -hmm. individual. And then it's, you go, you see back to the B2C side is actually way easier. I think at that point. Yep. And I think sometimes, I mean, how long were you in the call center? Well, 17 till I was, no, 16 till I was 19. Gotcha. I, I think there's a big difference there too between B2B and B2C too, because when you're selling to consumers, you can sell a lot based on emotion. When you're selling to business owners and decision makers in that realm, you're selling a lot off of logic and logistics, numbers, that type of thing. Yep. I think there's still the emotion side there. I think a lot of times people aren't as skillful to figure out what that emotion button is. For sure. And there's a difference between talking to a small business owner versus yep. someone in a corporate position. And a lot of times you end up in the corporate space where you have to figure out if that person can make the decision. Mm. And then it's like when that person can make the decision, that sale looks a lot different of you're painting, you're painting a lot bigger picture. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that sale looks a lot different. And I think that's when you start understanding sales a lot better is understand the scale of it. <laughs> this, this conversation is like conversation that we used to have when I was in that now, where it's like, now I've got a product that if you're coming to me, you're wanting it. Yeah. I mean, I don't even need to sell it. Yeah. Yeah. It sells itself through all the work and hard work that all the maintenance staff, the food and beverage staff. We've got this team around me that kind of makes it all great. And I just go, here it is. Yeah. But it's like that conversation was a lot of the stuff that we had when I was in the call center. I was like thinking about this and emotions and this. And now, like in the business that I'm in now, like, of course, it's emotional because it's a huge deal, but it's costing these guys a lot of money to basically change their life. And then yep. on top of that as well, getting them connected to other people in the same level of life. And, and uh, it's just, it's such a, because they call it a sales job, but I don't think it is, to be honest. I definitely think there comes to a threshold when you break it that I feel like I'm pretty understanding when I sit with a business owner, if it's actually a sell or not. Yep. It's normally, we have people that come to us that are looking for social media marketing, content mm -hmm. creation, all everything that they want, and they want the highest level of it. And it's not really a sale. Yeah. It's they found the avenue to get it. We're the avenue. And they just need the details and yeah. to do it. Super easy. And that's the one thing yeah. I've noticed again, following your stuff as well. Like you've got it out there so much. And that was one of the big things for me when we first got to the club. Like most country clubs, they post pictures of a whiskey glass or a dessert or like, I mean, everybody sees that all the time. Oh, yeah. So every I, restaurant, that. <laughs> every <laughs> single restaurant. Right. And like, I mean, yeah, you go, oh, that looks great, but I'm not going to spend X amount of thousand dollars to join that place just for that dessert. So kind of thought to myself when I was kind of thinking about it, like, why would we portray every single part of the club? Like we'll do maintenance, we'll do food, we'll do the chef, we'll do the general manager, we'll do me playing golf, the whole thing. And now from what we hear a lot is everybody's talking about it. Like it's like, yeah. this is on here. I've seen that, I've seen that, I've seen that. So if you look on your Instagram right now and you kind of scroll through the pictures on there, you know exactly what's going on at the club. Like you know how good the club is, you know how good the grass is, you know how good the food is, you know how, and it's basically a case of, how do I become a member of there? Oh, there's the competitive video of this guy, call me. And I've got a lot of people now that are like, I've seen all that stuff online. Let me just sign the paperwork. Yeah. It makes it a whole lot easier through the marketing side of it. So. And we talk about it all the time in the marketing space of, Business owners in today's world, and I mean, most of them think because they have, you can have the best golf course on the planet. And, but if no one knows about it, it's really hard to get people to sign up. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And business owners all over the place do it. And we have companies that come to us that have built just these mecca buildings. They have everything right about their business. And they're like, I can't get employees. I, when I get new business, I'm like, you, in today's world, you have a digital forefront of a business and you have a physical forefront. Yep. And there's a lot of people that are going to look at your digital forefront and can, how can you tell your story and put everything out about your company in that somebody sitting on their couch at home yep. is going to say, I'm signing up for this place when I get there. 
and that was that was one of the big things for me too. So we'd done a large amount of new members in December, which is kind of it was kind of crazy within our business because we were frozen. Golf course is frozen solid. We're completely under construction on this new <laughs> restaurant. But I'm like, what is everybody doing when they're when it's frozen solid outside? They're obviously not playing golf. They might be at X golf playing golf, but they're on their phone. Mm -hmm. So then you start yeah. going pictures in the summer, pictures in the summer, videos in the summer. And then it was like influx of people like, I want to join this place because I know what it's going to be like three months from now. And it seems to be working pretty well. So Yeah, I think that's yeah. also your, your thought process of it is much more from a branding move. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And a lot of people don't look at it from a branding move and that we talk about it in the marketing space is a funnel. You have your exposure level, you have traffic, and then you have actual sales. And most people are always want the, the sales side. They're always trying to sell down people's throat yep. and people wow. are numb to it in our world today. You do not need to sell down people's throat. Nope. Put, if you have a great product, now I, I will say, if you don't have a great product, then this is really difficult then you need to, to sell. <laughs> yeah. But if you have a good product and you keep the exposure level high, mm -hmm. And you maintain that traffic all the time, the sales come pretty easy. Yeah. It makes and, my life a whole lot easier by the stuff that we've been doing online. Yeah. And the cool part within the business that we've got, we've got over a hundred employees and we're kinda once we do a new hire orientation, it's like it doesn't need to be and you guys might disagree with this, but it doesn't need to be like a super fantastic high quality photo shoot kind of level picture or something but if you see something cool take a picture of it send it to me we'll throw it on instagram so i go back so i look at that from a level of in our world today we've been so accustomed to this high level of content in the grand scheme of running long term at a that you guys are a premium product i feel premium products should reflect that way online mm -hmm. so I look at certain companies that I may see their presence online and it's like, okay, that doesn't really match them in person. Yep. And it's, that doesn't mean that every single thing has to be over the top, but I feel like there's a space that lives for the feed mm -hmm. and your reels. And there's a space that lives for stories yep. that like our stories, I'll shoot stories in my truck driving in every morning. Yeah, yeah. But then it's like, I have a quality level that has to be hit if it's going on our, on our actual page on the reels, things like that. Yep. But it's also we hold that quality level yep. because that's what we do. And we have companies that are that way. And it's I'm just kind of OCD about it. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things for me on that stuff, too, is like I'm brand new to this, too. So I'm like learning as I come along and um, just starting to mess around with camera exposures and all that type of stuff, too. So um, you guys have been doing it for a long time. But it's like if it's on there, somebody's going to look at it. And the more um, exposure it gets, the best. So. And that's yeah. I would tell people that's better than not doing anything. That's true, yeah. And then there comes to a spot, though, like if somebody's just posting and posting, and we have a lot of companies that come to us, and like, we started seeing an uptick when we first started doing it. Now it's just kind of leveled off. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, how do you level it up even more? Yep. And then how do you continuously do that? And then that's when you start saying, okay, let's look at our current clientele. What's our audience look like? Who is that person that we're talking to? Mm -hmm. Who is the person that signs up? Mm -hmm. What does the messaging need to look like to those people to get them to sign up. We were talking before how many members you have that don't even golf there all the time. Yep. So then you start looking at it. A lot of people are joining because of the network. A lot of people are joining because of a lot of different entities besides actual golf. Yep. So then you start looking at like, how do you market to get more of those people? Because gyms do it all the time. Gyms aren't marketing to the guy that's in great shape. No. They want the person that's super overweight that may so start going to the gym. 10 bucks a month. Yeah, yeah. never go there. And it's, it's <laughs> yeah. the same thing with what Planet Fitness did. All gyms compete against trying to get the same 20, 25% of market. Mm -hmm. Planet Fitness came out left field and they said, hey, we're going to go after the 75 to 80% of the market no one's trying to touch. Yep. And those people aren't there all the time. And it's every business model is different on what that clientele looks like and what scalability looks like. And when you start messaging towards the people that are actual members that can end up bottom funnel. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the exposure level is not as high as some people want, but their actual return is much larger than they've ever imagined. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even having those members that don't play a lot of golf, we still want them to come there and use the restaurant and use the swimming pool and use the tennis courts and do all that stuff. Um, but in the recent years, there's been a lot of issues with that side of it. That's why we're kind of moving in that direction and putting new restaurant and new pools and all that stuff in there as well. So, 
Uh, we want people using the club as much as we can. Absolutely. Yep. So I got I got a question for you. I think I've got two, but I'll start with this one. Um, what's your? So I saw that you guys did a video with Good Good recently, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, I don't. It hasn't come out yet, has it? No. no. These guys are so slammed and backed up. They told it was going to be a couple of weeks, but it's already been more than that. So yeah. yeah. Um, what's your thought on the growth of golf over the last like? To me, it seems like the last five years with social media and all oh, yeah. these like golf type influencers. What's Ev your thought on that? Everybody's doing it. Yeah. And, and it's it's cool to watch it. Um, it's it's cool to watch. It's cool to see. But I think there should be a lot more um, respect towards the traditions of the game that's coming from yeah. the Scottish background. And look, I mean, a lot of these, I guarantee you a very high percentage of social media golf guys don't know the rules of the game. Yeah, they don't know where to drop their ball if they hit it in a hazard type stuff. It's cool you're getting a bunch of views on Instagram, um, but I would much rather they were learning the game and learning the game correctly. And the hats on back to front and um, shirts untucked and stuff being on the golf course, I don't like it all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So what's your what's your thought on the PGA Live deal? Kind of the the loosening of stuff with that whole situation? Uh, well, I mean, with them coming together, I don't really know too much about it right now. Um, but I think whenever they first came out with the live thing, even though it was a Saudi backed deal, I think it was really Americanizing the game. Um, because again, for me coming over here, I'd never been in the golf cart before until I um, came up was walking the whole time. I only golf cart. <laughs> I, I do not. Yeah. That's my point. Exactly. I do not walk your golf cart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they like say that. you're walking, I'm going home. <laughs> yeah, and then like it was uh, growing up and playing these tournaments and getting disqualified for not signing your scorecard and not signing your scorecard in the correct spot and mm -hmm. like getting suspended from a golf course for not wearing the correct pants in the um, clubhouse, all that stuff. It kind of it taught you a lot. Um, not just about playing golf, but about kind of being a gentleman and kind of, and it helps you a lot in business stuff too. Um, and I think all this new stuff is kind of taken away from that a little bit. Um, but I don't think it's going to go back in the direction that Rory McIlroy or me wanted to go in basically. Yeah. I, I, I completely agree with you there. Yep. I do think though that golf is, I think golf is now like cooler than it's ever been. Yes. Yeah, be that, because of all of these influencers, yeah. it's something that we talk about a lot in the social media space is the influencer, that type of stuff. And it's just completely changed, you know, a lot of different industries, including golf. The funny thing for me, too, is we kind of talked a little bit about people talking smack to me when I was choosing golf. The funny thing, you just remembered this, the funny thing is now is that all these guys that were giving me crap for that when they were playing football, now they're all messaging me on Facebook. Hey, can you give me a, can you watch my golf swing? Can you <laughs> what? Okay. But and I, I think, so it was something when I was, I think my dad started putting me in golf lessons at like 10 and I absolutely hated it. I was like, dad, golf's boring. I was like, I don't want to do this. Yeah. And now I look back at it. I'm like, I should have taken that a lot more I, seriously. I, I feel the same way. I, I, when I was in high school, like I didn't yeah. necessarily look at the golfers the way I do now. Yeah. But then I play with them now and I'm like, God, oh, they're so much better than me. I wish I would have yep. played when I was yeah. younger. Yeah. Same thing for me. Yeah. My my grandpa's been a marshal at Hodge for twenty three years now since he retired from his job and he was putting me in the uh, tee it up program at like 10 yep. years old and I wanted nothing to do with it. And I look back <laughs> yeah. on it and I'm like, why did I want to play baseball? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you look at golf as I feel like it has a lot more longevity to it. It's, oh yeah. Uh, it's a game you can play your entire life. Yes. And that's a huge difference from a lot of you ain't met, sports. Yeah, I don't think grandpa's. you've met a 55-year-old guy that's like, hey, I'm out still playing I mean, baseball his, on the weekend. His no. 85 years no. old, and we play with him every Sunday. Yeah, my so. my grandpa is 85 and drives the ball 220, 250 yards. <laughs> I've never seen an 85-year-old hit it that far. Yeah. But I, I, I think golf is – I think it's a good thing that it's – I do think it's losing some of the mm -hmm. overall, like – high level that it's been the but professional like the yeah. professionalism but i think it also is bringing a certain crowd into it it's bringing more people to it yeah it's yeah. bringing more people to it but especially I think it, the younger demographic i think the, it is leveling old, up some of the younger demographic the old rich white guy is gonna that's not what golf is seen as now it's yeah. more of a cool thing mm -hmm. yeah and it, it's for, one of those, for everyone not just that so and I, I like when i see that i go somewhere and i see some 17 year old kid in a golf polo with shorts on tucked yeah. in and like yeah. i i, I want to see more of that mm -hmm. because i do think they learn a little bit more discipline there is a little bit more professionalism in it that i think that is kind of lost 
and a lot of our school system doesn't teach that whatsoever. Yeah. I think and, a lot of that's to do a lot of that as well is that like if you look at I mean, if I look at twenty of the guys that I play golf with, they're out there with a thirty pack, the golf cart, the music <laughs> blowing. Like they're just out there having fun and that's what you do here, right? But yeah. then their kids growing up are seeing that, so mm -hmm. then they turn to that too. Whereas yeah. where I was from, it was press pants tucked in, you had spikes on, like it was abiding by every rule, even if you're just messing around, that was just the way that it was. You would no, never hear music on the no, never, no, never. No. So I go back and forth well, yeah. with the music deal. Yeah, I, I don't like. I don't mind it. But I have it a lot of bother me now. No, yeah, no. So I've done it for so long. Yeah. But, yeah, it doesn't like bother me, but it's also like I don't really care. Our world's noisy enough yeah. Yeah. that when I'm on a golf course, I enjoy quiet, the yeah. kind of peace and quiet. Yep. And it's everybody like all of our college buddies and stuff we go out with. <laughs> it's funny when I go golf with them. It's like winter style of golfing. When I go golf in Florida with. 60 plus year old men it's like a completely different style of golfing yeah it is dead quiet on the golf course and it's just i like it that way but i feel like i'm just kind of old in general so yeah. <laughs> old in gen getting old yeah, old school. yeah i am I, I like the the peace and quiet out golf and that's i, I have no problem going out and playing 18 by myself yeah oh yeah like, i do that all like the time it. yeah just enjoy it the, the only reason i like to play music is when it's a slow round and you're sitting there the one of the worst things in my opinion on a golf course is just sitting there waiting forever for the group in front of you but it's part of it yeah that yeah. happens a lot yeah. yeah so do you know have you seen this is a specific influencer the driver off the deck guy the dod king yep. <laughs> what's your opinion <laughs> of that yeah <laughs> It, <laughs> the crazy part about that guy right yeah he's doing the conor mcgregor act mm -hmm. right which is cool and the reason it's working is because nobody's done it before mm -hmm. right use a t <laughs> you know i mean but i mean he's, he's getting the attraction that he wants but the crazy part for me is he swings it awesome yeah he swings he it does. great and there's a reason that you can hit a driver off the deck like yeah. that just because he swings it really well. Yeah, for sure. Um, the arrogance thing, I think, is all an act. I think he's a, was he a carpenter or something? I think he's a he, yeah. woodworking guy or something. Yeah, he Definitely wasn't. He wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now he's got a job from it just by hitting a driver off the deck. <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> That's just the way that it works these days, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I think that golf is just going to continue to catch more and more traction. You see all the big brands that are getting into it now with Louis Vuitton coming out with all their yeah, golf line you, yeah and it's like I, I think you're gonna have all of your big brands that are jumping in on it and they're gonna bring their twist to it another one too is that you look at those the good good guys as well like what's happened with them and how their life changed and they're all 22 23 and now callaway's printing golf balls with their name with, on it yeah no it, it's super cool they're definitely my one of my yeah. favorite groups to watch and i hadn't really watched too much of their stuff before that but for me i was just very impressed with the way they handled themselves yeah it was they're, it was pretty cool they're good kids yep. it's cool that they're from kansas city yeah. too that's one of the, the things that i like so what's what's the future look like for you what's your your plan goals where's this take you i mean if i can play golf every single day and get paid for it then yeah it's pretty good to me um, <laughs> still want to probably try and do a little bit of the professional golf stuff yeah. i would try and do some uh kind of mini tour stuff and, and see where it goes um but, i mean at this point i'm with a a company that's kind of awesome company to work for and they've got uh like i say over 250 country clubs so if it ever became a point that i wanted to move i don't need to um worry about that because we've got options basically anywhere in the country um but i mean at this particular moment in time i mean everything at the club here we're especially having two clubs as well it's all going in great direction um, we're making good money at it golf courses are perfect i mean the only negative that i've got is that winter that we winter, get yeah. a little bit yeah yeah but when you've introduced the um golf simulators into that then it's a few months and you're good so. that's a game changer yep. yeah which i think you guys are building as a bigger business that's year round oh yeah yeah, yeah. i mean that that's been the probably the only negative thing too because especially when you've got somebody looking at a social membership um social memberships obviously a lot cheaper than a golf membership but um whenever the people can't use the coat the, the pools for six months out of the year not really justifiable for them mm -hmm. and it's the same way on the, the golf side but it just depends how avid a golfer you are you, you can still play golf in the winter but it's just not as good as it is right now yeah but if we can introduce golf simulators into that it's for whole families and then kind of take away a little bit that the pools are closed and then wait for the sunshine to come back and get the pools open again so yeah 
Very cool. What's the one last one for me? What's one the last one? What's okay. the Lo- Logan's been fiending and fiending all day for this. When he said we had a golf person coming on, I mean, I got all the hey. questions for. I know yeah. he he was sitting at his desk all day. He was ready. Yeah, I got my notes right here. What's the path look like for on that professional side? Um, at the point that you're at, what is that like? What are the opportunities? What are you? So the one thing that I've been doing recently, you're doing your Monday qualifiers, your US Open qualifiers, that type of stuff. But the the big thing for me, like I feel as if I have the the talent slash ability to compete at that level. But what people don't understand is there's a lot of these guys that are doing Monday qualifiers and sleeping in the back of their car that are better than 90% of the guys in the PGA Tour. Like these guys are playing golf 10, 15 hours a day, like what I was doing when I was a kid, but doing it when you're an athlete, basically, and then having the financial backing for it as well. Um, and it's kind of hard for me to justify, I mean, some of these weekends you go do that, it's going to cost you two or $3,000 mm-hmm. to go and do a qualifier when I know that I've been selling golf memberships for seven hours a day and yeah. not hitting golf balls for seven hours a day. Yeah. And then you go out and you do what you've done today, you go, then you shoot five under par, which, which is great, right? but that's not good enough when you're playing them on the yeah. qualifier. Do you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> and also today doesn't have the pressures of hey. the Monday qualifier for sure. Or that stuff yeah. too. Um, so it's, I mean, it's, it's all on me managing my time, to be honest. Like it's, uh, if I want to go and work eight to three or eight to four, and then go from that point to darkness and hit golf balls, it would work. Um, but we're not doing that very often. So it's hard to try and justify that couple of thousand dollars to go and play in one of those yeah. events when you've not been doing that. So, yeah. So what's that threshold look like breaking through if you are going to Monday qualifiers? Like, wh- You can it, play three good runs of golf and be in a major championship. Yeah, so it's essentially like a, there's like maybe four spots or however many. Yeah. The top four, they move on to the next round, next round, and then the final top, however many, get to play in the actual tournament. Yep. Who was the dude that was on that video that uh, – Michael Block. Was that the guy? That yeah, that's the yeah. He qualified. Yeah, yeah. He, well, there's that guy. Who is the the younger kid that didn't know he qualified till like the day before? Jumped on a plane, showed up, didn't have oh that was shoes oh, or corn ferry that, that, that was, guy, I don't know his name, but they, that was the one here, right? Locally, the local. I think was he like a, yeah, it was a, out south. Yeah, he like rolled up. He didn't have clubs. He didn't have. They literally yeah. had a bag yeah. of clubs and golf shoes, and he was like yeah. running up to his tee time. Yeah. He was like two minutes behind his tee time, and like literally slipped on shoes. They hand him a glove, and yeah. he just pulls out some random ass driver that he's like. I think he hit the first drive in the fairway. But, I mean, too, that's which is even more impressive. That's how a lot of those guys live too. Like it's kind of yeah. they don't know until last minute, and there's a lot of them. Even Gary Player back in the day, he was sleeping in his car at St Andrews, like and then wake up and straight onto the tee box. Costs a lot of money to play golf, especially at that level. Hmm. Yeah, and if yeah. you're not consistently performing, go get a job because that's yeah. just the way that it works. Yeah. Are there companies out there that like back golfers? A lot. Yeah, that's, that's. I mean, that's how a lot of them get started. Yeah. Um, but it, for that level too, is like you look at like when I grew up playing um, for a country, like we played alongside Rory McIlroy, and he was the same as me top five and then he ended up winning the world boys championship and i think 2005 or 2006 and that's a huge accomplishment obviously and then the Jeremiah hotels came and went you ain't paying for nothing again so that's what companies do in that situation but it's, mm-hmm. it's all about holding the putt, holding the right part at the right time in front of the right person yeah basically yeah. i mean you look at michael block I, too I mean, yeah he's giving golf lessons at a random municipal golf course i think it is and now he's probably got sponsorships for a bunch of different stuff. Yeah, the, I mean, he good. flopped pretty hard though in the actual tournament, didn't he? Not, not so he like finished the, the PGA Championship. He finished yeah, tied fifteenth. The uh, next tournament he missed. The, the next cut. one, yeah, yeah, the next one he missed. The, the cut, yeah, the one. In but you can imagine the pressure that's put on yeah. that guy. I mean, oh uh, yeah, and everybody's like, "Oh yeah, you flopped," and it's like, "No, not really. You finished fifteenth. Yeah, PGA he Championship. still got paid what he got paid for that two hundred eighty some thousand. Yeah, I mean, if I had if I have like one or two good putts on it. 18 hole <laughs> round. I'm, I'm pretty uh, so normally like towards the end of the podcast, one of our like kind of wrapping up questions is if you could go back to your 20 year old self, what would you tell yourself? Practice the way I did when I was 15, basically. Just keep practicing harder. Mm-hmm. Yep. I like that. 
I, I think that's uh we live by it all the time that you're never done learning, you're never done yep. practicing, putting in the work. It it keeps going, it keeps pushing. Mm -hmm. So But also on top of that too, like the the experience that I've kind of racked up through all the different stuff that I've done in the past even twelve years that I've been here, it's um it's not a bad position to be in and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for all that stuff. So absolutely. Yeah. 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 Like I said, I think you have a dream job. Do you have any final thoughts? <sighs> Come get your membership in the Nationals. Yeah, I mean, if, yeah, yeah. If you guys want He's to. He's your guy. You're talking about playing more golf. So I know of two golf courses that's, yeah, it's up there with yeah. the best. So, yeah. <laughs> if you guys want to do that, then I know a guy. You know a guy. Yep. Yeah. I uh, I definitely need to get more golf in my life. I, uh, well, I don't go. think you can ever have too much. Yeah. yeah. Hey, yeah. There's no one that couldn't use more. Now. I could play every day. Yeah. I do. I do. So I, I grew up like six minutes from the National. Mm -hmm. And I think growing up, if you didn't live there, the common misconception was that uh, still, you couldn't be a member. I still get that too, unless yeah. you live there. Yep. Um, I always knew that you could be a member at the Deuce, but I think that for a lot of my friends, like there was a common misconception that you couldn't be a member at the National. Federal yeah, and I mean, with changes in ownership and all the stuff that's happened over the past X amount of years, and some of that stuff, I don't know half of the, what happened. A um, lot of issues in the past as well, but with us being uh, the company that we are, and basically a golf management company that's it's a club corp was the name of the company and we just changed it to invited and the reason for that is we basically want anyone and everyone to come there um and with all the updates and renovation stuff that we're doing it's a uh, it's going in the right direction so yeah good good so anyone anyone can be a member at the yep. national as long as as long as you pay your bill just pay your bills yeah that, if you lift if you that's have listened this far just Pay your fucking that's bill. a pretty good strategy in life yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah and if you don't it's then it's kind of hard for some people i know yeah. yeah so thank you very much for coming on yeah. very much appreciate it um uh, guys this is chris bell we're going to put his links below uh tune in and once again thank you thank you that's, that's m3 crazy. podcast peace thanks for listening to the m3 podcast, m3 podcast. be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode Want to learn more? Check us out on Instagram at Moss Marketing Group, on Facebook at Moss Marketing 58, or on our website at mossmarketinggroup.com.